Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Premier Crew. Ben and I are back in the studio, and we are going to be discussing three great wines today. Uh, the first of which is from Italy, the second of which is from Italy, and then the third of which is from France. We will get stuck into those and introduce them properly in just one second. But Ben, how are you doing? Uh, I'm well, thank you. I'm well. Uh, aside from having a b- bit of a cold, I don't know if you you can hear it. I probably sound a bit nasally. A little bit, yeah. You do. You a little do. bit of a cold, uh, which I'm 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 fighting off at the moment. Um, it's uh, how it's, are you doing that? I did cold showers. Cold showers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had so I had a cold shower every day for two years without fail, and then I stopped like two weeks ago because it was just like it was just too much, it's too painful. Like it makes you feel good, but it's like really really painful. Anyway, lo and behold, I then sort of feeling like I was developing this cold and a really good way of combating that just like clears your system is having cold showers. So, um, yeah, I've been back on it the last four days. Um, just trying to, trying to, you know, clear the system and it's, it's, uh, it's working actually. I won't succumb. I will not succumb. Don't succumb. Well, I'm glad to hear you're back in the game. Yeah. yeah, Um, let's get stuck into the wines. Um, what are we going to start with? We are going to start with the white wine. So I'm going to take it away on this one. So the first wine is our whacking wonderful wine of the week. A white wine. It is uh, from Italy, from a region called Friuli. Um, and it's by a producer called Vigna Traverso. We got this one from a retailer called Jeroboam's. And it retails, I think, at 1990. So pretty, pretty good value. Um, but we have not had a wine on the podcast from Friuli yet. Um, we've had ones from neighboring Alto Adige neighboring Lombardia, but no one from Friuli. And that's quite exciting because um, it's probably one of the more exciting Italian wine regions where there's a lot going on. Um, And Friuli is based in the northeast of Italy, on the border with Slovenia. Uh, And frustratingly, for everyone listening, it's quite hard to understand the wine region without going into a little bit of the history. So turn off now. Yeah. Unless Here you want to we get, go again. Yeah. <laughs> unless you want to get bored to Yeah, I'm, well. I'm going to try the wine. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, try the wine, try the wine. But yeah, I'll keep it very short and sweet. So essentially, beginning of the 20th century, part of Friuli was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Then during World War I, there was a lot of fighting over the territory. Mussolini's Italy were sort of trying to take over that part of the, the world. And it resulted, that fighting uh, resulted in a lot of human and economic loss. I don't know the numbers, but it was pretty savage and there was a lot of destruction. When, when was this? Sorry. In, in World War I. Oh, right, okay. And nearer the, the back end of it. Uh, and Mussolini's Italy like captured a, a large chunk of it and so it became part of Italy. Um, and as part of his regime that he then took into and tried to almost standardise the culture uh, and make it like the rest of Italy. Um, so for example, one of the policies he introduced was he banned Slav languages. So what was the result of that is a lot of destruction, both in terms of economic post-war and lots of the other European economies were absolutely destroyed in that period. So Italy was no different. You've got a lot of human loss, the death, you know, due to the fighting. And then you've also got this huge cultural loss because it was getting really smashed up and suppressed by uh, Mussolini's regime. Mm. So these three things made That's what war does, man. So you're in that situation. And as a winemaker, that's just not really conducive environment to producing any good wine. You've got no domestic market because everyone's too poor to afford good wine. You've got no money to put investment into good winemaking. And you've also lost all the heritage and culture that's behind your winemaking because it's being suppressed. And it wasn't really until the 1960s when Italy went through a bit of an economic boom where that region started to recover and good winemaking came back to the area. Um, And like most of the other European economies, the 60s was a boom period uh, and lots of investment came in. At the same time, we covered this on other episodes, so we won't do it to death. Uh, Italy introduced sort of new wine regulation to up the average quality. And these two things coincided. Uh, to really stimulate the area. And a new wave of producers came in and they were led by one in particular called Mario Schiopetto, who's pretty famous. There were a couple of others like Herman and stuff, but Schiopetto is like the the main flag bearer. And they looked elsewhere uh, at what was going on and they brought in some of the technology from other wine regions that they saw um, 
to sort of try to improve the the winemaking that they were doing. And they just basically standardized and improved the quality across the end to end production. So they introduced technologies like stainless steel temperature controlled fermentation tanks. Um, very technical uh, <laughs> to, to to sort of increase the, the the quality of their wines and to really control it. And the output of their work is that you get the first sort of really high quality modern style Italian whites that are sort of clean, crisp, fruity, very approachable and very drinkable and technically very, very sound. Uh, and that was really like the output of their work. And they are very fine wines. And also at that time, because the economy was moving and expanding, they actually had a domestic market in which they could sell it into. And they basically started growing uh, in critical critical acclaim. Now, this producer, Vigna Traverso, um, wasn't a producer who started in the 60s or even the 70s. They started in the 80s. But I think the reason that's interesting is because if you want to get a sense as to what that sort of modern style Italian white tastes like, a lot of their winemaking technique uh, is very representative of the sort of style that Schiopetto introduced. So they use stainless steel. Mm -hmm. uh, so fresh, classical, precise. Exactly. All these sorts yeah. of things. They use stainless steel, no oak, all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's just a really, really good example. Um, but yeah, you've you've now had a little mm. sip. What do you think of it? Uh, yeah, I really like this wine. Um, we tried it first a, a, a while back, which we'll get onto in a second. But I think it's good. It's 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 as good as I remember, which is nice. It's um, it's. I know we've just talked about being clean, precise, and classic. But actually, on the nose to this wine, certainly there's a bit of richness, there's a bit of salinity, and there's you know a little bit of peach, a little bit of pear, that kind of profile. And on the palate, I think the thing that really stands out for me is the texture. I was expecting the wine to be, uh, you know, a little bit leaner, but actually it's very silky. It's got a lovely texture, lovely mouthfeel, um, which I don't remember from when we last had it actually. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's really good. It's that salty element. It's got a decent level of acidity and, um, yeah, I'm a fan and, uh, we haven't actually tried this for a while. Um, so I'm glad that we, we glad that, um, our memory sort of served yeah. us well from uh, well, from how good it was when we first showed, showed well. when we first tried it, it I'll, I'll come on to my opinions in a second when we <laughs> first tried it it was a completely ridiculous night um so we tried this wine <laughs> uh so boxing fans amongst you will remember when anthony joshua was at the peak of his powers and then um he fought this quite fat chubby mexican dude uh called andy ruiz and then he got knocked out and it was like one of the great boxing shocks and i think because it was happening in uh that was also one of the things that was really cool about it. It was happening in... Uh, I think it was Dubai or something? No, no, it was in New York. R round two was in... Hence why we were late, yeah. In Saudi, but it was in New York in Madison Square Gardens, which is obviously like, you know, the Hall of Fame of boxing. And uh, yeah, it was just the whole thing was hysterical. And it was like five in the morning. I was completely delirious. We probably had like three other wines. Yeah. Uh, and there were a couple of us. And yeah, it was just a really, really bizarre evening, but absolutely hysterical. Yeah, no, it was a, it, it was a, it was a great night. I think we probably had more than three wines. It had been quite boozy. And we flicked on the boxing at like 10 p.m., right? And then we, we we were watching it. Well, I watched it continuously through to the end of the, the AJ, AJ fight before I then got in a taxi to go home uh, at about 6 a.m. My opinions on the wine, just very briefly. Mm, mm. I think it's really delicious. It's going to go with kind of like any seafood, Great summer drinking. I would say it's relatively precise, but not overly complex. It's quite simple. I'm not sure it's like going to be the most exciting wine anyone's ever tried, but it's going to be really enjoyable and great for sharing. And it comes in at a really, really nice price point. Um, the only other thing I would say just on freely before we move on to our final wine, there are we've, like, we've only done one. Oh no, no, the other second. <laughs> there are like a new wave of winemakers coming in that are not really based about modern techniques they're actually harking back to tradition and they're the ones who are really pioneering skin contact whites which are also known as orange wines um and the likes of radicon and gravno and things they're using the same grape variety which is ribolia giala um and that's a whole nother thing uh, that people will know for uli for but we will leave that for another episode but they are also worth amazing and worth trying um, but this is just a different style. It's probably not so in vogue at the moment with, you know, what's going on in the wine scene in the UK. But these wines still deserve their mention. And that's why we wanted to get it on. We'll do, an, we'll do another rep. Another rep. Fe featuring the other side. Yeah, another yeah. rep, another rep. 
All right, Benny, take us away on the next one. So let's go. Let's go. So um, for this wine, this is a this is a red wine falling into our fine wine category this week. It's from Italy, from the heart of Italian wine producing areas, Piedmont, great varieties, Nebbiolo. And um, this retails for £34. And we got this one from the Wine Society, thanks to the fact that we both now have memberships, which is cool. Um, <clears throat> both members. I know, I know. Um, so yes, this wine is from Barbaresco. Now, Barbaresco is sits, as I mentioned, in the heartland of Italian wine producing regions. It's a DOCG in Piedmont, in northwest Italy. And most people know of Barbaresco and Barolo. And I'm just very, very quickly, because we, we, we've previously covered this, but Barbaresco, rightly or wrongly, is sort of known as the queen of wines and the little brother to Barolo when it's often compared to, to Barolo. Barolo, um, you know, is known as the, the king of wine and the wine of kings, producing typically stronger, more structured, more tannic, more acidic wines with, uh, you know, a greater longevity um, and wines that ultimately can be quite uh, difficult to drink in their youth because they're, they're just... Pretty, they're pretty powerful. They're pretty powerful. Um, but yeah, if you want to hear a bit more about that, we discussed it in episode 11, I think it was, you ran us through. So we, we, we won't recap it again. Um, but just very, very briefly, um, the appellation of Barbaresco is essentially um, made up of four townships, if you like. One of them, slightly confusingly, is called Barbaresco. The other is Neve. The third is Treiso. And the final one is San Rocco. And they all produce their own distinct styles of wine. But, and you know, maybe some people don't want to hear this, I, I would say it's, it's fairly, um, fairly well known that Barbaresco produces what is seen as the, the, the best wines, the most classical wines from that area. And that's exactly what we've got today. And not only is this you know, a very classical area, um, it's a super classical producer. And the producer is Prodaturi, which we're, which we're going to, talk uh talk a bit more about in a in a second um but before we before we delve into any particular details i think it's worth noting that actually we have a priest a man of god to thank oh. <laughs> to thank for bringing uh th this wine to us today there's always people in religion with wine yeah it's, it's, yeah mm. don, don Perignon, the famous monk exactly exactly although isn't that sort of mythology Probably. <laughs> well, according to Peter Crawford, anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, so th th this, um, just to sort of run through it briefly, there's a, a priest, a uh, priest in the town of Barbaresco back in 1958, in between reading the Bible and delivering sermons every Sunday, realized that a number of individual wine producers from across the region couldn't sustainably carry on with production um, because of essentially cost implications. Um, and the only way for them to sort of continue on was to club together, to group together, to join forces um, and essentially, yeah, club together and form what is now known as Produttore del Barbaresco, which is a cooperative. Mm. And that's when a number of producers essentially get together to benefit from the efficiencies of running a bigger operation, sharing their networks, sharing their knowledge, and also basically benefiting from reduced production costs because you can have one you know, one centralized facility rather than having a number of different, you know, winemaking facilities. Yeah, so it's, I guess it makes you a farmer, not a winemaker in some ways. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And they, it's a uh, definitely a different structure to just, you know, being a being a winemaker yourself. Um, and I'm sure it's probably quite a complicated thing to be a part of, but ultimately it allows people to access, you know, uh, wine growing um, viticulture without yeah having to be having to be a winemaker yourself and it sort of gives those, those who want to focus on the winemaking part access to you know fantastic growers fantastic farmers um and you know more fruit to make more wines essentially mm. um so this this all happened back in in 1958 and the priest uh clubbed together with 19 producers at the time to set up um set up the cooperative and it's quite funny actually because the first three vintages after after they all grouped together the first three vintages they actually made in the cellars underneath the priest's church, which oh, is just, right. yeah, it was quite amusing. But anyway, after a bit of time, they built winery opposite, which is still in use today. Um, and Prodaturi 
I would say are the the bastions of Barbaresco, really. Um, they took, you know, two decisions uh, sort of since their inception in, in, in 1958 that sort of led them to become what they are today. One of those decisions is to focus purely on quality. So only working with really, really good farmers um, to, you know, source the 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 the, the best fruit um, and just make sure that the 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 fruit they're getting enable them to make the 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 best wines. And the other thing um, that they focused on as well is only making wines from Barbaresco. And that's kind of put them on the map. And that's why I said they're, you know, bastion of Barbaresco, because their their decision to do that and their focus on quality over time has basically given them the notoriety and reputation that they have today. I mean, Prodotu just generally has to go down as probably one of, if not the finest cooperative in the world. Because there are, just for reference mm. for everyone, there are other cooperatives in other wine regions. So just as an example, in Chablis, there's one called Le Chablis Sen. Um, and I guess it's similar to a negotiation model where you buy grapes from different farmers and then do the winemaking yourself. It's not a dissimilar model. But often those wines don't have the same commitment to quality. Mm. And yeah, just the fact that, you know, they're now prestigious collector's items is just very, very cool. Uh, and I have to say, they are creeping up in price generally, the their wines. So it's a good time probably to buy them. But they are still like relatively affordable for the for the profile. And like, I know you're just tasting it, but on the nose, I think this wine has really like just a it's just classic. It, all their wines are just classic. And this is classic Nebbiolo. It has this sort of like dried, leafy sort of character and like a real nice purity of sort of red, bright cherry, almost cranberry sort of fruit. And then on the palate, uh, the front palate is actually so generous and you really get that fruit coming through. <coughs> but then in sort of classic Nebbiolo style, this is 2019, the back burners or the back palate, the tannin and the acid is just so strong that it is just an absolute powerhouse uh, of a finish and, and, and the way it makes your mouth sort of pucker. But what I would say is that if you're patient and you're willing to put sort of 10 years on this, this is a sort of wine I just if you can afford it, snap up uh, as often as you can mm. because it's just always, they never make bad wine and it's always going to reward your patience. Uh, and it's the sort of thing you'd want, you know, a little case of at some stage in your life, hopefully with a bit of bottle age when it's just really, really singing. Tucked away for a future Friday night with a little steak frites and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, you're getting an insight into Ben. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. The glutton. Uh, the glutton. <laughs> Thank you, Hugo. Thank you for that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think that 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 sort of um, that rounds it off. Oh yeah, the let's, final one. Let's move on to our our final wine for today's episode. So this is uh, our good value wine. It's a red wine from France. It's from the Rhone. It's from the Southern Rhone. It's uh, predominantly a Grenache and Syrah blend, and um, it's available from Tanner's Wine Merchant. And uh, we picked this up for thirteen pounds fifty. So it really is. Um, a very affordable bottle of wine. Um, and before we before we get into um, the Tanner's own label stuff, which we're talking about, I'll just do a very quick recap of the Rhone. We've covered the Rhone uh, a couple of times, but just um, just a quick overview. The Rhone is based in southern, sort of southeastern France. It's France's second largest appellation behind Bordeaux. They've been producing wine there for well over two thousand years. 27 permitted grape varieties, and there's 5,000 producers who are based down there. So there's a lot going on. But as a general rule of thumb, keep it super simple, it's nicely split into two camps. You have the Northern Rhone, which mainly produces um, red wines from uh, Syrah, grape variety, and Southern Rhone, where red wines are made from typically blends of Grenache, Syrah, and Mouvedre. And that's just, you know, if you're wanting a, a very like high-level rough overview, that's what you get from uh, that's what you get from Rhone. And within the Rhone, your best value wines are Cote de Rhone's, which is what we've got here today. And if you're ever, you know, in a in a restaurant wine list or or looking to buy a bottle of wine for Friday night, you know, Cote de Rhone is a is a is a great starting point. Cote de Rhone Village is is perhaps even better, but we'll we'll discuss that another time. Um so this wine, uh, just to explain, is Tanner's own label wine which you may or may not have seen before, um, they partner with a number of their, uh, they partner with a number of their producers to basically label wines under their own name, but they'll have the producers make wines um, from their estate um, 
And what that gives you as a consumer is access to, you know, great winemaking heritage under the wine merchant's name, meaning exceptional value, basically. Um, and, you know, from a, from a really good wine merchant like Tanners, who work with, um, you know, a huge range of, um, you know, fantastic, uh, fantastic growers, you know that if it's got their stamp on it, their seal of approval, you're not going to go too far wrong when you're buying. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not only, you know, they've got, uh, Tanners have got a massive range of own label wines and they also do spirits and they do sherry as well and port and, um, and all that kind of thing. So as a consumer, if you're looking for something, um, you know, try a, a particular wine that's typically representative of the, 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 the region or the appellation of where it's from, but for a very approachable price point, it's worth, it's worth seeking out. Um, and this wine is produced by uh, a producer called Domaine Font de Michel, um, who have a very long and well-established history of uh, producing wine in the Rhone. They can trace their family roots back there, more than 400 years, back to the year 1600. There you go. There you go. I know, been kicking around for a while. And um, it's a family, family-owned, family-run estate. It's uh, 30 hectares of vineyard run by two cousins, Bert Bertrand and Guillaume. And their education in winemaking stems from working at none other than Le Fleve down in Pulini, which um, is on paper about as big and as serious as it gets, really. Um, and they, they've, they've been going for, they've been now at the helm since the early 2000s, so well over 20 years. And since taking over, their philosophy in the vineyard has really been focused on um, care for the environment focus on soil quality and they haven't used any fertilizers or herbicides or um, or artificial herbicides or pesticides for over 20 years are they certified organic they are Ooh. they are certified organic yeah exactly um as of, i'm not sure as of when but i think when they took it over they realized that that was the you know that was the that was the way to go and um their focus is also very much on on quality all plowing that they do in the in the vineyards is done manually. Um, all harvesting is done by hand for everything from their coat drones all the way up to their Chateauneuf de Paps. Um, and the other cool thing about them is that they've got really, really old vines ranging from 50 to 110 years old, which, as we've discussed before, you know, give the wine more structure and more depth, a bit more character. And, um, you know, 50, 50 years as your as your youngest vine is uh, quite a cool thing. To also, have. Um, Grenache vines mm. are quite scrubby looking. They like they're not like a classic vine that you'd see on your sort of laptop screensaver. They sort of just pop out and they're very stubby and sort of scraggly and ragged. And uh, it's just quite funny because a fifty year old Grenache vine is going to be particularly sort of scrubby and looking. well. Imagine what <laughs> imagine what one hundred and ten year old vine looks like. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's uh, that's um, pretty cool. But it's um, yeah. This we we were at a Tanner's tasting um, a few months back, and we had well, probably fifty wines that night. And this was a real standout for us. Um, and when we were thinking of what to put in the good value category, um, we thought it would just it would fit the bill perfectly. And it's nice to show an example of you know a wine merchant's own label range that um you know really hits home you're just not going wrong with yeah. this you know this type of wine on a friday night it is southern rhone um and it is uh, you know grenache and syrup blend so you know it is quite you know fruity and it's quite big but actually it's got enough acidity in the wine to to really lift it through probably want to drink this with some food rather than you know by itself but it's a be a really good you know friday night value so, uh, you know, value bottle. So um, do have a look. For those that aren't uh, based in the West Country and over in Shrewsbury, where Tanners are, you can, uh, you can purchase it uh, online. Yeah. I think my perception, just having tried it again, uh, is that one of the things that can be sometimes to Grenache's fault is that if it's hot and the winemaking is not careful and the viticulture is not careful, it can become quite sticky and jammy. But what's really great is that, especially for the price point that this is playing at, Actually, it's not sticky and jammy at all. It's got a good amount of freshness and acidity, um, but it's still got those like classic sort of gamey, um, sort of uh, almost like cherry spiced fruit, slightly leathery as well. You know, obviously we really like Tanners and that's why we wanted to showcase this one. And we like this specific wine. But there are also, if you know, you should check out, if you think, if you shop at a wine merchant that's also really good, 
they're likely to have also their own range. So we'd advise sort of dipping into that as well and trying what they've got on offer. It's not always the most sexy thing because sometimes you want to be that person who's found the new producer or the new kid on the block who's doing something interesting. And there's something fun about sort of being the first mover and being able to show that to your friends or whatever it is. But actually, if you want something that's just, you know, is going to be reliable and really tasty, uh, then these are a great option. Mm, yeah, yeah, agreed. Well, I think that probably we've rattled through today, but um, yeah, that probably takes us to the end of the episode. It does indeed. It does indeed. So all that's left to say is thank you to everyone for tuning in. Your uh, your support is much appreciated. Listening to Hugo and I drivel on week after week. Uh, so we, uh, yeah. we don't drivel then. We, we... we don't drivel. We don't drivel. <laughs> yeah. Very well articulated, Hugo. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much for your support. It's much appreciated. Um, if you want to get hold of any of the wine today or check out any of the merchants that we've mentioned, we'll put a link to the uh, link to their website and the wines in the, in the uh, description of wherever you're listening and watching this. And um, Final thing to say is that Hugo and I, as usual, will be back next week for another episode with a guest. Um, yes. But in the meantime, thank you very much. And we'll see you then.